This game took me an entire month to program. I call it Ghost Evade, because you play as this at sign being chased by a ghost, represented by an exclamation point. It is a buggy, text-only roguelike that doesn't even actually look like this. It instead looks like this. Yeah. <laughs> And it took me a month to program, not because I'm a bad programmer, though that certainly didn't help, but rather because I wrote it in an obscure, esoteric programming language known as Brainfuck. This is the story of how I lost a month of my life, and my slow, painful descent into madness as I attempted to write functional code in a very unfunctional language. So what exactly is Brainfuck? This video isn't going to go into too much depth explaining Brainfuck, but the quick summary is thus. Brainfuck is an esoteric programming language. That's deliberately the simplest programming language possible, which ironically makes it maybe one of the more complex languages to learn. There aren't really any applications for Brainfuck. I mean, I can't think of any real applications for it. I think it's just kind of a dumb toy for programmers to mess around in. Brainfuck consists of an infinite array of 8-bit integers, and on top of that array is a program pointer which can manipulate individual values inside of that array using exclusively 8 commands that are broken into 4 pairs. The plus and minus signs increment and decrement the value of the array cell the pointer is on top of, respectively. The greater than and less than signs move the pointer one space either forward or backward. The period command is the print function, and outputs the value of the current cell in the form of an ASCII character. So if the cell the pointer is on top of has value of 100, the print command will then output the ASCII character D. And inversely, the comma command is for input. So if I call a comma command and then hit the letter A, it will store the corresponding ASCII value into the current memory cell. The last two commands, the square brackets, are the most useful, in my opinion, but also maybe the most difficult for me to explain. The brackets are utilized for loops, and so when the program encounters an opening bracket, it assesses the value of the current memory cell, and if that value is anything but zero, it will execute the commands contained within the brackets. And if that value is zero, it will skip to the end of the loop and continue execution from that point onward. Same with the closing bracket. If the value of the current cell when the program encounters the closing brackets is anything but zero, it will skip back to the opening bracket and execute the code contained again, and if the value is zero, then it'll skip ahead and continue execution. All other characters, everything else, is ignored. Let's take a look at some example code real quick. This right here is a Hello World application written in Brainfuck. It takes a little over 300 commands to execute, and here's a rough breakdown of how it works. Also, for comparison, um, this is what Hello World looks like in Python. Yeah, it's just a little bit different. Here we use a little bit of multiplication to insert the value 72 into cell 1, and then the program prints that to the console, leaving us with a capital letter H. Then this little function clears the value of cell 1 and resets the pointer, at which point we use multiplication to insert the value of 101 into cell 1, and then print that value, then again clear the value of cell 1, and so on, and so on. So doing the simplest thing takes all day. And despite this, this programming language is actually fully Turing complete, meaning we can do some wild stuff with it, including writing some pretty schnazzy games. This programming language kind of broke my brain in both a good and, I don't know, maybe a little bit of a bad way. Positively, it made me actually kind of feel good about programming, like I've always had a sense of imposter syndrome when it comes to code, but I think that if I can write Brainfuck, I could probably write assembly if I put my mind to it. But negatively, I am now, I swear to god, just obsessed with this programming language. I got sucked into it right before I was about to move states, and I had just resigned from my job with a month left. They stopped assigning me work, of course, so I started to get super duper bored. But I needed the money so I couldn't just like walk out of my job. At first I played a ton of Sudoku. But then I got a little bit too good at Sudoku, and it stopped being as fun, so then I ported Wordle to Microsoft Excel. But Wordle isn't actually that much fun either. So finally, bored out of my gourd, 
I turned to BrainFuck to keep me entertained while waiting to be done with work. I decided to write a text-based roguelike, and there were three things that I wanted to achieve. The main one was, of course, player movements. You can't really have compelling gameplay without some form of interactivity. The second was collision detection. What good is player movement if there's not a world to interact with? And the third was artificial intelligence. Oofy oof. What an objective to have when writing code in BrainFuck. I don't want to say that I was naive in setting this objective for myself. Ultimately, I was capable of writing artificial intelligence in this totally gnarly language. But ugh, it was a doozy getting there. If I wanted to write the same program in a language like C-sharp, I would create a multi-dimensional array of characters to be the playfield, and then assign a vector to be the player's location. I could then probe for player input and easily increment or decrease the player's vector components, and then map that onto the playfield. Unfortunately, BrainFuck supports nothing. It does not support multi-dimensional anything. You cannot natively have vectors. The memory array is one-dimensional, so we have to do some little tricks to make this work. This is our program memory. I know it looks two-dimensional, but that's a lie. I just wrapped it around so it would fit on screen. I reserved three memory cells down here at the bottom, two to serve as the player's vector and one to act as what I call the player's absolute position. I want the playfield to be a 10 by 10 grid of text, each grid cell having its own memory cell dedicated to it, so I need 100 bytes of memory to accommodate that. In order to emulate a 2D playfield so we can plot the player character on top of that, we need to assign each cell in our playfield an absolute position as well. Which can be accomplished by numbering each cell from left to right, top to bottom, 1 to 100. Okay, I'm sure that there's a better way of doing this out there somewhere, but for the sake of prototyping, I wrote this. It's hard coding all of those values into those memory cells. And that's somehow just stuck around to the release version. It's not the greatest. After each memory cell in our playfield has been assigned an absolute value, we then need to assign our player an absolute value as well. Let's say we want our player to be plotted at vector 2, 4. We can find the player's absolute value by multiplying the y value minus 1 by the column width of the playfield, and then adding the x value to that. So the code for that looks like this and 2 comma 4 essentially becomes a value of 32, which if we compare that to our memory seems to be in just the right spot. But in order to actually plot the player's position on the playfield, we gotta get a little funkier. BrainFuck, of course, doesn't have a command for arbitrary pointer movement, so in order to plot this we're going to have to manipulate the entire array to get the value of the player's position set just right. We're going to subtract 1 from each cell in the playfield, and then one from the player's absolute position, and we're going to do this over and over and over again until the point where the player's absolute position reaches zero. And then the only other space within the playfield that should also be zero will be the corresponding player space. Then we can employ this little function, which will scroll through the playfield, setting each space to the ASCII value of 32, or a space character, until it hits the cell with a value of zero at which point we can write some code to set that value to 64 or an at sign, the character I'm using for the player character. And then we can write that same little function again to scroll through the rest of the code and set the remaining space to a space. We can then render, god it feels weird to call this rendering, then we can render this to the screen by scrolling through the program printing each value in our playfield and every 10 characters printing a new line character. And if we run the program, woohoo our player character is just where we want it to be. But I don't know about you, but I don't think this is a very fun game. To make the player move, we need some way of parsing user input, and in BrainFuck, that is kind of a process. The method I found of parsing player input requires 9 bytes of memory, and a few dozen commands at the least. We're going to use WASD for player movement, so the first byte of memory in this subsection is reserved for the actual input. The next four are comparators, which we've written some code to assign them the ASCII values of WASD and D. And the last four bytes are if-then flags that will be set by the comparators. So let's run through it. First we'll pull user input. Let's say the user presses D. The value of 100 will then be stored in our input byte, 
and then we can decrement our input character and our comparator bytes over and over again until our input byte reaches zero. At which point, just like in our playfield, the only other value that should be zero is the value that previously corresponded to the letter D. We can employ this little seeker program that will find the first memory cell that's set to zero, and once it's found the corresponding comparator, we'll move the pointer forward four spaces and set a flag. These flags are essentially if-then statements, or at least they will be when married to the code. Essentially, they are saying, if this value is not zero, execute some code. So we're going to write some code that scrolls through all four of those flags and executes the code that corresponds to the set flag. In this case, since we've set the flag for D, we can move the pointer over to where we stored the player's X value and increment that, so we're moving the player one space to the right. I know I kind of breezed through that, um, so I hope it makes sense. Oh, we'll see in the comments. If you need some clarification, just shoot me a message. Then we need to loop the entire program infinitely, otherwise it will halt after one key press. And that's not fun. To do this, we'll surround all of the code in square brackets and ensure that before the ending bracket, our pointer always lands on a common value that's set to anything but zero, so it loops endlessly. Then we need to do a little cleanup before we can loop again. We have to totally reset the playfield so it's bare absolute positions. And we have to reset our input comparators to their appropriate values. And once that's all done, hoo hoo hoo, we have working player movements. Let me tell you, I was so stoked when I got this working. I shared my little cubicle at work with a few other people, and I shared a desk with this very, very sweet woman who was like a mom and not super into computers. She knew that I had been slacking off for a week writing gibberish code, but she never really asked me about it. But when I got this working, I was so over the moon that I just had to show it to anybody, somebody, you know? She was so sweet and tried her best to be supportive, but this was also an early prototype where I was just moving the player around a 4x4 grid, and I could tell that she was not very impressed by my magnum opus. Next up is collision detection, which I was super nervous about because I had no clue how I was going to accomplish this when I first started. I went down a lot of dead ends in my code and attempted a lot of things that outright broke my program, and oofy oof. It turns out the appropriate solution was right in front of my face the whole time. Each wall in the playfield is represented by a pound sign, and this is the layout I settled on. The solution for detecting collision was so much simpler than I could have ever imagined. What I did was find the absolute position for each individual wall, and just hard code those into a reserved subsection of memory. And then I took user input and calculated what I called a proposed absolute position alongside the absolute position we had from earlier. Then I did the subtraction trick on that proposed absolute position and my array of wall positions. If at the end of the operation one of the values in the wall memory corresponds to the proposed absolute, then we know a collision has occurred, and we don't move the player. If none of the values are zero, then we know that the player hasn't crashed into a wall, and we can let them move. It's not the most elegant solution, I feel like this doesn't leave me the most room for expansion down the road, but in Brainfuck I will honestly take what I can get. Finally we come to enemy artificial intelligence, and I have tried and tried and tried to make this section fit in a reasonably sized video, and it just didn't quite work. And I think I'm going to have to save this for another video. There are a few things that I'd like to do to improve this. Aside from explaining enemy artificial intelligence, I'm sure in the next video I'm going to go over a few of those. The most notable one that I can think of is I think I can decrease the amount of memory required to store the map and also increase performance. I think if I employ a little trick used by game developers for decades now at this point. I could store just one quarter of the player map, do all of the like collision calculations, everything just on that one quarter, but then once it comes to rendering, I think I could flip that and flip it again and have a full play field. Additionally, um, I received this really great email from Daniel over at brainfuck.org, and one of the things he challenged me to do with this is to try to fit it under a kilobyte. I don't know if that's possible for this program, um, just due to the nature of how much it has ballooned out in scope. But it's something I'd like to try, and so the next iteration of this code is going to be cleaner, it's going to be faster, it's just going to be better. And so I hope you'll stick around with me to see whenever that happens. And finally for this video I've got some shameless self-promotion. 
If you're so inclined, I would love it if you would subscribe to this channel. Um, I've, I've said before, I'm not interested in being like a YouTuber or whatever. You know, this is never going to be a platform that I monetize. But you know, it would be nice to grow this channel a little bit. Um, I feel like there is a benefit to putting my stuff out there. And if you want to watch it, stick around. And finally, I just barely moved to the Pacific Northwest. I live in Portland, Oregon now, and I am looking for a job. I come with a whole slew of CompTIA certs, I'm working on some Microsoft certs, I know stuff about computers, uh, so if you work for an IT or tech company, um, maybe consider shooting me an email. Let's talk. My email is june at junebush.com. Thanks so much for watching this video and I'll catch you on the next one.